Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, we focus on the International Criminal Court, which is now considering allegations of serious human rights violations by leaders of Hamas and Israeli officials. Len Rubenstein is Interim Director of the Center for Public Health and Human Rights at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He speaks to Dr. Josh Sharfstein about the nature of the allegations, the controversy that has been stirred, and the next steps in the process. Let's listen. Len Rubenstein, thank you so much for coming back to talk to me on Public Health on Call. Thanks for having me, Josh. So you are the interim director for the Center for Public Health and Human Rights. Your work has been about public health and human rights in the context of war. And now we're reading about the International Criminal Court. Could you first give a little background? What is the International Criminal Court? You have to go back to the Nazi trials in Nuremberg tribunals after the Second World War, where Nazi officials were charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity. There was interest starting at that time for an international criminal court that went way beyond the specific charges against Germany and later Japan. And the idea was there should be individual criminal responsibility. That is, those who are responsible for carrying out these crimes as individuals should be prosecuted and if convicted, sent to prison. But nothing happened for the next four or five decades. And then in the 1990s, the war in the Balkans led to the establishment of an ad hoc tribunal by the UN based on evidence of massacres, mass rapes, and other horrific crimes. And it set up another tribunal for Rwanda after the genocide in 1994. And following that, there were so-called hybrid tribunals, which involved both national and international personnel for Sierra Leone and Cambodia. And that all created momentum for an international criminal court, which was negotiated in the late 1990s and went into effect in 2002. Many countries have joined this court, although major countries, including Russia, China, United States, Israel, and others have not. So at a high level, is the purpose of this court to be an enforcement mechanism for major human rights violations? It is. It is about individual criminal responsibility. And that idea has a great deal of power and importance because it can achieve both a measure of justice for the victims, just as domestic justice systems do for crimes. And it has a potential to lead people who plan these kinds of crimes to think twice about doing so because they can contemplate future punishment. What crimes come to the International Criminal Court? They include crimes against humanity, which are major crimes committed in war, such as murder, execution of prisoners, deliberate attacks on civilian populations, starvation of the civilian population and others, including attacks on health facilities. It also has jurisdiction over crimes against humanity, which are a widespread and systematic crimes committed against a civilian population, whether in war or in peacetime. And it also has jurisdiction to prosecute genocide, which means actions to destroy in whole or in part an ethnic, national, religion, or racial group through various means. How do cases get to the court? There are a number of ways that a case can get to the court. One is if the crime was committed by a national, that is a military official or political official of a state party of the court. Another is if crimes were committed on the territory of a state party 
or in a state that is accepted jurisdiction of the court. The third way is for the Security Council of the UN to refer a case to the court. Those are the basic ways that a case can get there. Tell me about the processes of the court, maybe at a high level. People get charged, but of course they get to defend themselves. How do the checks and balances work? The prosecutor of the court can open an investigation, a preliminary investigation, it's called. And as if the prosecutor believes there's sufficient evidence for a case against an individual, he or she has to go to three judges of the court and get approval for an arrest warrant. That's a key check so that the prosecutor can't go rogue or at least the prosecutor's evidence has to be preliminarily reviewed by judges. So it can't be initiated simply on the say of the prosecutor. After that, it goes to a traditional criminal trial, assuming the person is brought before the court. That means the person has to either come voluntarily or be arrested. And that's been a problem over the years to get people before the court. But there is no trial and absentia in the court. And a trial is held, and there's a person can be sentenced to prison, and of course there's an appeal process. Let's turn now to the charges against Hamas officials and officials from the Israeli government. Could I first ask you just to explain what are these charges? The charges against the Hamas leaders, there are three of them, arise out of the massacres, rapes, and hostage-taking on October 7th, as well as the abuses of hostages while in captivity. The charges against Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Gallant all arise out of the restrictions on humanitarian aid, particularly food for the population. They are charged with intentionally starving the population and depriving them of the necessities of life. And it really is the first time a kind of public health basis for a charge in the International Criminal Court has been brought. How did these charges get to the criminal court? Which of the paths that you mentioned before did they take? They got to the court under the first path I mentioned, the provision that a party to the court can request jurisdiction over crimes. Palestine has a very unique hybrid status within the UN. It's a state for some purposes and not for others. For the purposes of the International Criminal Court, it is recognized as a state. So the the crimes are alleged to have been taken place on its territory, and it can therefore invoke the jurisdiction of the court. And where in the process that you mentioned are these charges? The charges are are awaiting review from the three-judge panel. We don't know when that will take place. And it's up to the judges to decide whether the case will go forward. If they do, a fuller investigation will go ahead and possibly a trial if the individuals charged are taken into custody. So we're at the stage where the prosecutor is recommending charges, but there are no arrest warrants, for example, under the jurisdiction of the court as yet. That's right. He's, re- he's requested that the warrants be issued. I want to ask you more about the charges. Let's start with those against the Hamas leaders. Are they limited to atrocities on October 7th, or do they go beyond that? They focus mostly on the atrocities of October 7th, but also concern the abuses of hostages while in captivity. Let me turn then to the charges against the Israeli leaders. What is included in these charges and what is not included? The charges being made against the Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, and they arise out of the restrictions on humanitarian aid, particularly food aid, and the denial of essentials for the survival of the population. They don't address the question of the bombing of civilian areas, whether they were 
intentionally targeting civilians, whether they were illegally attacking hospitals. The prosecutor said that he was going to address his investigation to these kinds of issues going forward, but they are not included now. Now the focus is on starvation of the population. You mentioned that in some respects, these charges are unprecedented because they focused on health. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Yes, the charges are about nutrition, malnutrition, famine, and whether this was a deliberate policy of the government, given how long the months and months in which food aid has been restricted and convoys have been attacked, and in fact, humanitarians delivering food have been attacked. So these charges have generated a lot of discussion and commentary. I want to ask you about some of the things I've read about it. One set of criticisms says that by charging both Hamas officials and Israeli officials, the court is asserting an equivalence between them. Do you think that's fair? The charge of moral equivalence is an incendiary, but I think baseless charge. There are all kinds of ways to make moral judgments about different kinds of crimes. For example, moral differences between first and second degree murder. But there's no suggestion here of any moral equivalence between Hamas leaders and Israeli leaders. They're charged with different crimes, and it's also not the responsibility of the prosecutor or the court to make those moral judgments. It's to enforce the law, and there are laws cited that each of the parties is alleged to have violated. And it's really important because, as the prosecutor said, His duty is to apply the law even-handedly, assessing violations by both sides. His job is not, and he hasn't, made charges based on moral equivalency. And that's, in fact, what the rule of law is about, whether it's domestically or internationally. Let me ask you about the argument that this isn't the right way to resolve a conflict in a criminal court somewhere else in the world, that conflicts should be resolved through diplomacy, through politics, and that this might be a distraction or make it even harder to resolve the conflict. That argument has come up and has been raised ever since the International Criminal Court has been established. That is that pursuing criminal charges makes it more difficult to achieve peace. But there's no evidence that that's true. In fact, it's perfectly possible that the pressure of potential criminal prosecution could lead to a more rapid settlement. We can't predict, but there certainly is no evidence that justice gets in the way of peace. And I can add that there are circumstances where if negotiations for peace are at a sensitive level, the proceedings can be postponed for some period of time. So what should we expect to happen next? You said that the prosecutor has brought the charges to a three-judge panel. How long does that take? There is no timetable. It is up to the judges to review the allegations and make a decision. It might be easier in this case because the prosecutor appointed an expert panel of kind of world-renowned experts in international criminal law to review his charges, and that's a public document. And that review may help the judges. Obviously, they will consult other other laws on their own, but we don't know when they will rule. And of course, if they issue the warrants, that's not the end of the matter, because the process is either the Hamas would have to turn over its leaders to the court, Israel would have to turn over its leaders to the court, which we know won't happen, or they can be arrested if they travel to some other place, other country, which is a member of the court, which would be obligated to turn them over. It's been a major problem in many cases that arrest warrants have been issued, but it takes a long time for the defendant to be turned over to the court. Even if, in this case, it's not possible to bring 
people to the court and the court can actually hold a trial. Do you think that there's a value in the process in the work that goes on to bring the charges, the work that goes on to decide whether or not to issue warrants? Does that send an important signal as well? I'd say first that even if it takes a long time to get individuals before the court, there are many cases where they have been brought. Sometimes it takes years, sometimes even decades. But those warrants will be outstanding. They will be a Damocles sword over the person's head. And the process of justice may be slow, but still can move forward. Beyond that, I think it's important for the legitimacy of the court to apply the law even-handedly so that it is not just countries that we don't like where cases are brought, but that everyone who is alleged to have committed war crimes or crimes against humanity can be charged. Because human rights are universal. Yes, absolutely. And not only are human rights universal, but the enforcement should be equal wherever violations take place. Well, Len Rubenstein, thank you so much for coming to talk about the International Criminal Court, these recent charges, and we'll have to see how this process unfolds from here. Thank you very much, Josh. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace fernandez Ciciri. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production management by Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace fernandez Ciciri. Analytics by Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send us an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.